Hello there, good evening and welcome to this very special Q&A edition of our Wednesday premieres. Of course, today I'm really excited to have, you know, somebody join me. You can already see her. N normally she needs no introduction, but she's my best friend. She's my wife. She is at Gold Rock Church, uh, Director of Pastoral Ministry. So, of course, wherever you are, wherever you're watching from, please join me, celebrate the love of my life. Pastor Sube, Kubela from Butu. So we are both SKF and it's it's a really beautiful thing. Um, I want to just seize this opportunity, baby, to thank you for the love that you bring and thank you for your consistency in trusting me and giving me room to, you know, serve God freely. Um, thank you for the woman that you are, for the wife that you are. I love you. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Hello, everybody, and welcome to this very interesting episode of the Wednesday premieres. I am excited to be here. Normally, it's always my husband, but today I have the privilege to join him. Um, he's my husband. He's my friend. He's my teacher. Ah, he's a lot for me, and he's also the lead pastor of Good Rock Church, Babe. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Everything that I'm going to be sharing here is just everything that I've learned from you in the past seven years. I'm really happy to be here with you today. Nice. So um, let's get to it. So we're just going to go straight into the questions. But just before we start answering the questions that people asked, first of all, what we did is we went through the questions. Many questions were similar. Okay, They're like repetitive. So we kind of pulled out the questions that stood out. Um, and also, we'd like to say as a disclaimer, these are our personal opinions based on our, our own study of the word, based on our journey, right? Yes. Based on where we are, our own experience from dating to marriage in the last seven, eight years. Um, you know, so these are things that God has taught us from mentors and leaders and all that. So, of course, you may not agree with some, some things that we're going to say about men or women, may not apply to every man or every woman that you know. However, um, we would like that you continue the conversation in the comment section. So for some of the questions, feel free to drop your own answers in the comment section. And we really just want to create a space where we can learn from each other. And if that is okay, we'd love to get into the first question. So the first question we have here is, what is the point of marriage? Is it for sex, reproduction, why exactly should people get married? Tell me, babe. Tell us. Why should people get married? Why did you marry? That's a setup. Why should I start? <laughs> okay. Um, what is the point of marriage? I, I feel like there are many, you know, perspectives or there are many angles to this question. But my from my own study, and when you really study scripture, you get to find out that marriage is really about family. You know, the family unit is God's incubation system for humanity. So when God said that we will replenish and multiply and fill the earth, he expected that the family should be an incubation system for that dominion mandate, which he gave to, of course, Adam and Eve. Okay. And there's um, no unit on earth as strong as the family. Now, who says family says, of course, there's going to be sex and reproduction. Who says family says there's going to be companionship. So I really think the purpose of marriage is the creation of family, of God's incubation system. God wants to incubate children. There's, a, there's an environment in which children grow when the family is together, when we have the man and the woman with their differences and their uniqueness with their similarities, with what makes a man a man and what makes a woman a woman. And in that unit, uh, identity is formed. In that unit, you know, connections are built, love is demonstrated. You know, when you talk to any child, at the end of the day, family is their first picture of humanity. So they get to think about human beings based on how their families were. And you'd find out that family is also how you know, we get to relate with God. How you relate with your father will influence how you relate with God. How you relate with your mother, your siblings, will influence your relationship with God. So I think the purpose of marriage 
is the creation of the family unit, which is God's incubation system. Of course, it's going to have sex and reproduction and companionship and friendship and yes. all of that in it, but it's about family. Mm. Yeah. This is an aspect that many people don't think about. Mm. Other than the family aspect, other than the companionship and just the friendship, um, there is also the aspect of discipline. Marriage will discipline you in ways that ah. you've never imagined. I, I promise you. Wait, how did you say that? <laughs> she said, I've disclaimed. Yeah, I have first hand experience. I'm not Marriage disciplining somebody's daughter. You. And when I say discipline, <laughs> I'm not talking about any form of lashing, please. Yeah. Okay. I'm talking about the attitudes that marriage will find will create in you. Marriage yeah. will fine tune you. Yeah. You know those. You know it's when you're single, it's easy to just say anything. It's easy to say I don't. I don't think I will get up in the night to cook for anybody's son. No. I will not wash your clothes. I will not uh, do this. Yeah, you will be his mama. Who. Ever. You, you, you. <laughs> and this is not but going to be forced. This will come naturally clear. because. You love him. Please let me step in. She loves me and I know she does all that, but you know, this goes both ways. Uh, you yes. know, for the gentlemen who are listening to this, we think, you know, I'm causing mm. somebody. By the way, she actually doesn't I'm talking wash about my clothes, you. just so you know. Wow, baby. Yeah, she doesn't. I and, used and, to. I used to. Yeah, well, say it, say it then. She used to when we started, oh. but now we, we have somebody who helps us with the laundry. Uh, but but this goes both ways. You know, I agree with her, but I have to step in just so it doesn't feel like I'm just a disciplinarian who is straightening up somebody's daughter. No, 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 no. Um, no, it goes both ways. I've learned some levels of discipline that I never had before marriage. So, yeah. Okay. Um, first of all, he stepped in to save himself. But the truth is, I wasn't meaning um, you get disciplined as in anybody is going to force you into doing anything or it's just going to create um, create things in you. You're going to learn patience. You're going to learn yeah. forgiveness. You're going to learn kindness. That's if you truly love, the, love this person and you want to make it work. You will need these things. And if you didn't bring them into marriage, my dear, you will have them by the time... <laughs> By the time you know it, you are more patient, you are more forgiving, you are more kind. The things you say, oh, I will not take this so half, please. If you just talk to me like this, I'll go back to my mother's house. You will more not go tolerant. back to your mother's house. Yeah. You will become more tolerant. You know, yeah. when you've had those kids, a lot of things will happen to you when you get married. I think everybody should get married. There's a lot to learn in marriage, a lot. You know, so <laughs> other than the companionship, other than the family, you will become a better person. I bet you. I've become way better than I was before I got married. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I concur. Me too, by the way. Right. Question two. Okay. Uh, we really let me, let me read this question. It. Okay. No, let me read this question for us. This person asks, when we remove sex from dating, us singles in the 21st century lose context of what dating really is. What exactly does it mean to date? Should we date at all? Did you date? What is the reason for dating if there's no sex? So, wow. This person has jump like, boxed like well, six questions, six questions in, in one. one. Yeah, but we get the point. What is the point of dating? First, we dated, right? Yeah. Like, yeah, we I mean, had enough time for dating. So maybe, you know. So, yes. yes. Should we date or should you date? Yes, you should date. I think it's really important that you date. We dated... And I feel like many people are very confused about what they should do while they're dating because um, society has sold us the idea that dating is just for sex or relationships is just for sex. Yeah. You know, but um, I believe that there are a lot of things that you can do while dating that has nothing to do with sex. Um, I feel like first, during your dating, there are a lot of things you can talk about. That's the time you get to know yourself first because once you get into a relationship with somebody aspects about yourself that you didn't know will come up you you realize that you know you're not as patient as you thought you were or you're not as um generous as you thought you were so a lot of things will come up so yeah. i think that dating time first of all reveals who you really are 
you know, there's a thing that people say that uh, until you are you are with somebody, you don't really know who you are until another person can trigger you and bring out things from inside of you. <laughs> You've not really know you don't really know yourself as much as you think you do. So during that dating period, you will notice a lot of things about yourself, yeah. and that is the time to work on them. That is the time to to handle them. You can talk about money. Money is a very many people work on eggshells um, when it comes to money. You can talk it's a hard about conversation. Yeah, it's a hard. In fact, that is the time to have hard conversations. Yeah, ask them questions. Ask them. Ask them if they love to bathe. Ask them mm -hmm. if 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 what's their relationship, what's their relationship soup with water? soup and water. <laughs> you know, it's the time to see how they eat. How do they chew their food? You know, how do they talk to people? Are they kind? Are they generous? Are they, do they easily give? You know, so there are a lot of things you can talk about. You can even talk about sex without necessarily having sex. Yeah. You know, talk about different sex styles. Does he love anal sex? Mm. Don't come into marriage and one day your husband wants to have sex. He only wants so that anal he wants sex. Only anal sex. Yeah, and anal. you are hurting and you are suffering and everything is happening. So I feel like it's a time to talk about yeah. everything. Talk and, about and these are everything. things that we actually discover when casting people. Yes. Um, at Gold Rock Church, we have created something called the School of Marriage. We believe that people succeed at things that they are educated in. Exactly. And uh, of course, if you have to be a great businessman, you have to kind of study business. So we created this thing where we study marriage and not just studying marriage as in preachings and teachings that is involved, but in also following couples or poor from dating to courtship to marriage. And during what we call dating counseling, we tell the people that dating highlights your individuality. That is a moment where you really get to know yourself. You know how much you can tolerate, how much you cannot take, what you can do, what you can't do, what you thought you could do that you really cannot do. So you're studying yourself in dating. In courtship, it's a bit different because you're studying yourself in partnership with another person so you're studying you know sharing you bring something and bring something that's more highlighted unity is more highlighted in courtship and then in marriage union is highlighted so our singularity we become one and of course in marriage the elements of our individuality and our union or our sharing come into play but these are important phases you should not miss you know, have the hard conversations talk about everything mm -hmm. but really the problem is when you start having sex when you're dating, what happens is that you start to think about your union, whereas you should be focused on your individuality. You see the problem. So you can't be having sex when you're dating. And of course, many people will not agree with this, but we're talking about dating the Lord's way and doing things God's way. So if you're a child of God and you want to honor God, you have to decide that you're going to keep yourself until, you know, after wedlock. So that's what we think. Um you want to read question three? Okay. How do we really know if a relationship will end in marriage? <laughs> well, how do we know if um a relationship will actually end in marriage? Some people think it's hard to know, but we can know. So the first thing I would recommend is if you're dating somebody, don't wait until he has proposed. Then you go and start doing pre-marital counseling. Do dating counseling. You know, those hard conversations we just spoke about, sometimes you need a third party to kind of moderate those conversations yeah, and give allow context. them and give context to allow them to be had. So go for counseling. What that does is it will show you the red flags that you might not be seeing when all the butterflies are in your belly and you're seeing pink and blue. So, you know, your counselor is not in love with your partner. So they'll tell you this is a red flag. That is a red flag. So there are a number of red flags and there are many resources. You know, you have to read books. If we have to talk about this thing, we'll not end here because there are so many things that if you see in a partner, don't, for example, your partner beats you up when you're dating. Mama, what are you still doing there? They play. <laughs> so... This is not something to joke about, right? If you he, say, oh, he just slapped me. He was angry. I, I annoyed him. Listen, if that's a major red flag, and there are many other things, it okay? Should not, it should not end in marriage. Yeah, it should not. Just end it quickly. Stop it. Don't even go back. You know, seek serious counseling if anything has to continue. So, well, you know, go for counseling anyways. And if you need us to help you, you think we can help you, we're going to leave our email 
uh, the church email in the description and you can always reach out and we can help with some resources or answer your question for that. Right. Share your question four. At what point in your relationship did you think it was time to marry? Hmm. I don't know if this person is asking about our personal relationship or, or in general. Mm -hmm. But in, with respect to our personal relationship, I knew from day one when I just saw this babe. Really? <laughs> she says, really? <laughs> We've spoken about this before. You see, you see, when I just saw her, I knew. Um, sometimes you just know. For me, I just knew. However, I had to validate it with counsel. So, of course, I showed her to my leaders and to different authority figures in my life. In fact, I, I, I was serious about validating with counsel that when I was taking out some, some of my authority figures, my state of heart was, if they say no, I will not go ahead with it. You see, I was that intentional about counseling. However, I knew from day one, I saw her commitment to church she had taken higher soul winner prize a number of times. I was excited. This is ministry material. <laughs> you know, she's also a very friendly person and she used to work with me. So I, I think we had a lot of time to be friends. And I was like, you know what? This is the kind of person I want to wake up every morning seeing. So that was easy. So sometimes this question will be answered easier if you focus on friendship. If the person is your friend, you would sometimes have enough information to decide if it's any marriage or not. But as for me, from day one, I saw the Lord. Oh, wow. <laughs> but I also think that um, courtship too is very important because it leads you into that readiness. So after you've spent time with the person, you've seen how they chew their meat and how you know they talk and um, relate with people, then you can say, okay, yeah, maybe this is the kind of person that I want to be with. That is why I'm always very skeptical about when people say, oh, I just met him online and three days later, they're <laughs> getting married. I'm like, how how well do you know this person? How do you know he's not a serial killer? Yeah, So obviously. Courtship also leads you into that. With counseling. With counseling, see, yes. Uh, we, with we're, we're going to stress this point all through every answer because talk to people. There are so many things you don't know. There are so many things you don't see. So, of course, I'm saying I knew from day one, but I needed to validate with the authority figures. I needed counseling to validate. There are things that no matter how long you stay with somebody, you will never see. And on day one in counseling, everything gets revealed. So you don't know each other. You don't even know what conversations to have. So sometimes when we say have the hard conversations, you think you have had the hard conversation because you spoke about money. But like she said, you walk in on day one and the man says, um, all I want is anal sex or something like that. Then you realize you didn't even know what to ask about. And there are many other conversations that you might not even be thinking about as we are speaking. But we have a list. In fact, Conversations Couples Should Have is one of the books that we are going to be re releasing. Yeah. yeah. Just conversations and questions to ask. So it's just a, it's like a workbook that you will just follow. So a number of resources, we're going to release a number of books very soon. So expect, okay? Um, yeah, there you have it. Okay, question five. Should you love your partner according to your love language or the yes? My love language is physical touch. So, and my husband's love language is um, quality time. So if you want to show my husband that you really love him, then you spend time with him and not quantity time, but quality time. So you spend time bonding and just chatting and exchanging. I think um, if I really want to show him that I love him, then I'll spend that time with him. I cannot show him that I love him by, you know, constantly touching him. He's not going to interpret that as me loving him he would probably understand because he knows the languages and he understands that if i touch him it means i'm telling him that i'm madly in love with you but i think you should love people in their love language you know but you must understand yours first yeah then you love them in their love language so if somebody's love language is gifts you cannot say you love them if you've never given them a gift exactly you know you would buy them gifts you just to show them that you love them because you know once you offer them that gift they're like oh my god they are loved they feel loved and special so you have to love people in their love languages 
That is why you need to know their love languages and you need to study and know how these people interpret different things. Yeah. So love people in their love languages. Yeah. Exactly. By the way, we're going to put some resources in the description. For example, the love language test. You can take the test to know your love language and you can take it with your partner to know their love language. Okay, so love them in their language. That's what you understand. Question six. How do you know you were meant to get married or not? This is not to be wasting time in a relationship. <laughs> so maybe this person is asking how do I know if this marriage thing is for me so I stop wasting time in a relationship is that how you're understanding it yes yes okay no. I hope that's how you ask that's what you mean but that's how you're asking it well how do you know you're meant to get married first because you desire to get married okay I don't know if there's any other reason why and I don't know if you're asking about if you're meant to get married to the particular person or just get married at all. But if you're asking about being married at all, if you desire marriage, then go for it. Okay? <laughs> Except the Lord appeared to you and emphatically said it's not for you. That I can't speak to. But I believe that marriage is honorable and beautiful. It was created by God to be enjoyed by all. So if you desire it, don't kill that desire in you because of the fear that you might not have a partner or you might not meet somebody that you love, you know, trust in God and, you know, learn. And I'm very sure that you're going to find the love of your life. So you'll enjoy your relationships. Sure. So, so, you know, well, if that's not how you're asking it, you can always um, tell us in the comment section and we're going to try to respond even better. Okay. Yes. So next question. Question seven. In a relationship as a girl, <laughs> I love this one. Is it important to love or to be loved by your partner? Mm -hmm. And this is because the Bible says women should be submissive and husbands should love. Mm -hmm. Is it important mm -hmm. to love? I, I think both partners need love. Yes. Yeah. Both partners need love. However, they interpret the word love in different words. For example, love to a man is largely spelled respect. And that's why the Bible tells the women submit. Um, respect in that context is really honor. You know, respect is not just obeying what somebody says. Respect is high esteem. The word respect means to highly esteem. Mm -hmm. So when the Bible says submit, you know, or when men say they need respect, you realize that what they're really asking for is honor. Every man, you know, uh, somebody said every man has a king in him and a fool in him or a baby in him. So the one you speak to will respond. So if you speak to the king in him, the king in him will respond. If you speak to the baby in him, the baby in him will respond. So um, as a lady, you love your husband by giving him honor. Just elevate him, respect him, praise him. But love, on the other hand, is spelled security largely for women. They want to feel safe, you know, financially safe emotionally safe spiritually safe psychologically safe you, you know she's getting excited already so they want safety everything that looks like i'm okay so for women love really means that covering that protection that security of your tenderness so even the way you talk to women you have to be tender you know when you raise your voice they don't feel safe anymore you see what i mean um, you have to provide for them. So all of these needs that we may have are just tied to one word, security. So respect for men, security for women. Mm -hmm. And all of that is love, you see. So however, in that particular portion of scripture where Paul is saying, love your wives as Christ loved the church, he's talking about the way men are expected to love, which is sacrificially love unto death. So if one person has to lose, the man should be the one. Does that make sense? So if there's a decision to make and there's a compromise, God is saying, you know, the weight always has to be on the man. So just be aware of that um, as a man and just kind of yield into that. All right. It's good. I also think there's a part where the man falls in love. The one they call, um, social media calls the finished man. And <laughs> I feel like it's very important that um, your husband actually falls in love with in love with you yeah. who is in love if expresses deep affection expresses deep way. affection yes yeah. yeah. so when you have a man who loves you oh my goodness mm. you have it, it's so sweet 
can see her tail is shaking. Oh my god, I have it too. She's getting excited, you know, the you butterflies. Know, you see the things he does, the way he looks yeah. at you, the way he talks um to you. You know, there's this saying that goes, you would know that a man has time when he loves you. He will give you his time. Mm -hmm. He will give you his attention. He will give you his money. He will give you his everything. So it's very important for your husband to love you. Mm -hmm. He should. Do I love you? Yes. <laughs> so much. <laughs> Chale. <laughs> It's love sweets. No, okay, that okay. one. That's the finished man part of me. Okay. Which question will we that again? I forgot the question. You know, all those question seven. Oh, question eight. Is it okay to make the first move as a girl? Hmm. <laughs> Babe, you are the girl. <laughs> I'm a woman. Is it okay to make the first move <laughs> as a girl? Yeah. Okay. I think um the, the so answer. She has gotten serious. She wants to talk to the ladies now. Please, please, please don't listen, don't listen. I think the answer depends. Mm, people have different perspectives, you know, with the worst Western idea and everything that comes with it. But for me, I'm really traditional. Mm. No. Stick to the old rugged truth. Stick to the old. Uh, first of all, I'm a hopeless romantic. I believe yeah. in getting proposed to and fainting. So... I feel like a man, it's in a man, it's embedded in a man to chase. It's embedded in a man to follow, yeah, let him to chase. hunt. Let him so hunt. Please, please, let him hunt. Don't even take that away from him. If you yeah, can't open his mouth and say, this is what I, I want, want, nah, he's that's he's not good. a good sign. Yes. Call us old school, but again, that's our opinion. Yeah. But you know, before I, I, yeah. I, I didn't think that, to be honest, I was of the opinion, if you love the guy, just tell him. No. Bird, I think um the tables have turned, and I really feel like if a man loves you, he should chase you is, yeah. and tell you that he loves you. Now, let and me say this you. this other part too, right? So, gentlemen, let me talk to you now. So, ladies, they are saying let the man make the first move, but gentlemen, let me say something. Sometimes you think you're the one making the first move. These ladies, I'm telling you, <laughs> these ladies know strategic position. You know, if a lady decides to make the silent moves, soft power moves, you remember the story of Ruth and Naomi and how they took Boaz. Boaz really thought he was the one taking Ruth. You know, he's Boaz, a wealthy man. But Naomi and Ruth had strategized. So, ladies, I'm going to create this balance, right? I think that at the end of the day, you make moves, but just be subtle about your moves, okay? Um, this is risky because I can't draw the lines here and you will need us a lot more conversation to talk about this and training. Uh, but read the story of Ruth and Naomi. They position themselves. And let me tell you the moves that a lady can make. You can invest in your personal development. Yeah. Go to school, study, improve your language, smell good, talk nicely, dress nicely. You see, there are some ways that you carry yourselves. No matter how you look, no matter how beautiful or not you are, there are things that will still be a selling point to you. The way you talk, the way you take care of your body, you know, how nicely you smell, just how you carry yourself, your aura and confidence. You see, when you walk into the room, you've already made the move. Mm. If the man can chase you at that point, he doesn't deserve you, man. Just let him go. You see, but make the moves, make those first moves, okay, so that you're rightly positioned to be chased, okay? to be chased after. And keep making the moves. You see, this pretty woman looks beautiful mm -hmm. always. So I'm always making the moves. Okay, that that we're not gonna zip that out. Okay, okay. So please don't send um text messages or anything. Yeah, trying to ask a boy out. Yeah. Number, what number would that be? Number nine. Number nine. Yeah. What are some practical tips in resisting the temptation to watch porn? Oh, and maintaining a healthy perspective in sexuality. Hmm. What are some practical porn. tips in resisting the urge to watch porn? Okay. L let me say this. I think we're going to have a live session on, you know, dealing with addictions. Okay. But first of all, um, you have to understand where addictions, pornography, and masturbation, and all these things come from. We call them counterfeit pleasures because they come from a desire to be loved. And most often, these come from, you know, 
an absence of love in your childhood. So either you did not get enough paternal love or maternal love, or you just experienced so much rejection or separation of your parents, you know, so, um, or you were just exposed to this too early. So the family unit was broken. Again, when marriage is done right, family is done right and children are raised properly. Now, um, that's sometimes where it comes from. And if that is the case, if you're struggling with this, my first recommendation is go for counseling. Talk with somebody who can help. And again, uh, my wife and I started an, an organization called Sanity Global Foundation. And it's really mental health support, research, and advocacy. And we've helped several people struggling with these addictions. And we have seen recorded testimonies, okay? That's one practical thing. Talk to somebody, seek professional help. Um, the next thing sounds spiritual, but it is true. The Bible says in Psalm 119, verse, um, I think verse 109 or so, or verse, verse 9, one of those. How can a young man cleanse his way, keep his way pure? And the Bible says, by taking heed unto your word. Make the word of God your delight, mm -hmm. right? The next thing, um, which is more practical, accountability systems again it's like talking to somebody but this is just like having someone that you vulnerably say i'm struggling with this and every time you feel the urge you basically just tell them hey i'm feeling this urge hey i'm i'm, I'm about to do this not after you've done you see before hey i feel like doing this right now that's one practical thing you can do again a lot has to do with your company and what you're surrounding yourself with surround yourself with the right people surround yourself with the word every time you feel the urge you can you know, play some worship music or, you know, listen to a message, a preaching online. So you can just get on our YouTube channel and just do some, you know, go drop touch YouTube and chill. You know what I mean? So those are some things that you can do. But again, I always say start by going to a professional so that you can diagnose where it is from. When you diagnose where it is from, then you don't just kill the symptom, you kill the problem. I also feel like most people who are dealing with um, porn or any addiction are always very ashamed yeah and they don't want to talk about it yeah. they don't want to talk about it but i feel like that is the easiest way yeah. to to, to start with. yes yeah. dealing with the addiction because anything that is concealed can easily go yeah. but anything that is exposed you know yeah. you can it gives you an opportunity yeah. to start um, working on it so talk to somebody and if you don't have money to afford a professional find a trusted friend a trustworthy friend Talk with them, let them be your accountability partner and tell them, I feel like doing this. Somebody who will not judge you, somebody who will not laugh and make fun about it. Yeah. Just talk to them. I always advise, talk about it. Talk yeah. about it. It's a big thing, guys. Yes. Talking when it about comes to relationships it, and love and sex and marriage, you realize that the more wisdom you have, the more counsel you have, the safer you are. True. Yeah. So the more the merrier. Okay, question 10, I suppose. Is it possible to experience sexual pleasure and explore my own body through masturbation while maintaining sexual purity? <laughs> <laughs> okay, no, we don't. We're not laughing to shame you, yeah, but of course you know. not. <laughs> but <laughs> it feels like you eat your cake and have it. Yeah, you know, it's like <laughs> let me just masturbate and still be pure. Mm. You know. You know, the funny thing is that some people feel like masturbation is not sin, yeah. but sex, yeah. you know, intercourse. That means, sin. how can masturbation be a sin? I'm not affecting anybody. <laughs> yeah, you're doing you it know. alone. Let me say this before we try to answer this question. Uh, we have a book coming up called This Thing Called Sex, oh. and it's a letter um, to a very sexually active generation. It's God's word on sex to our generation. And that's going to be out much sooner than later okay so just a number of resources that we're working on that series that book is coming from a series on sex that we had in church and it was very interesting because it's, it's a real deep and vulnerable and extensive manual on just sex and sex education for this generation right so we talk about masochism and all these different sexual practices the spirituality the psychology and the yeah. biology of sex really extensively and one of the things that we noticed when we're, you know, having that series and trying to put all this material together is that sex is one of the most difficult things to define in our generation. Yes. You know, you know, virginity has become so difficult to define. And so, um, first of all, you have to understand that masturbation is creating sexual pleasure for oneself. Right. And in that book, we also kind of talk about why God intends 
for sexual pleasure to be created only for your partner. And there's there's a lot of reason to this. And time will fail also talk about this. But first of all, the Bible emphatically said masturbation is sin. It's listed among sins. You see, it's not even our mindset. It's not our, it's where we don't infer. It is in scripture that masturbation is sin, right? You're missing the mark. You're offending God. In fact, you're, you're drawing away from God when you do it. True. Right. First of all, because nobody masturbates with the blank in mind. True. You see, sexual true. purity begins from the mind. Jesus said, if you look at a woman lustfully, you have already committed adultery with her. And when you're masturbating, when you're masturbating, sorry, usually you have watched pornography or you're thinking about somebody. Usually that's where the problem starts. And there are other reasons to why it's a sin, but usually it's because of what's going on in your mind. You're having sex with somebody in your mind who you're not married to or who you're not committed to. And that's where the sin begins. Does that make sense? So you cannot talk about masturbation and sexual purity because masturbation is already walking away from sexual purity. Um, we have some resources on sexual purity. Every year we do the 40 days of sexual purity challenge. Um, you know, you should join our community, follow us on Instagram and all channels so that when we start the challenge this year, you know, you can be part of it and also really learn about sexuality as a child of God. Okay. So um, that's it. Maybe you have something to, to add to that. <clears throat> you said it all. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So question 11. Okay. What are some healthy outlets of sexual energy and desire if I'm choosing to wait until marriage for sex? <laughs> yeah. These guys, <laughs> healthy outlets of sexual desire. You know, I keep, I keep, I keep trying to, you know, with the past, the last three questions, I feel like, youths are trying seriously to handle sexual desires and just find yes. a way around it no matter what yes. because the pressure is getting harder yes. and that's why the book is entitled mm -hmm. this thing called sex a letter to you know a sexually active generation mm -hmm. actually a very funny generation but we don't say it that way <laughs> first of all you have to understand where all of this desire is from right um we are very stimulated we are a hyper stimulated generation a lot of the contents that you're watching online from movies to music, to just different conversations, to all kinds of social media content, a lot of that has sexual content. And so you're constantly being stimulated, all right? It is very important that um, knowing how stimulated you are, you start to create a personal culture of purity. You see, because now you're asking, how do I let out this sexual energy, you know, in a healthy way? The first way is to avoid abstinence, just not just avoid sexual activity, but actually avoid the sexual content. If you want to manage that energy, stay away from what stimulates it. So there are some movies you cannot be watching. There's some kind of music you cannot be consuming. There are friends you cannot relate with. There are places you can no longer go. And that's the thing about being a child of God. It is not just the thing you said yes to. It is also the thing you have said no to. In saying yes to the Lord Jesus, you're saying no to so many things. You see, and, and that's the message of the cross. So um, if you want to manage sexual energy, number one, move away from the things that stimulate that energy. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, number two, become a part of a community. These are general tips. Become a part of a community where sexual purity is highlighted, where it is a core value. Mm. Just join a community where we talk about sex openly, right? We're not shy about sex. There are churches where they don't talk about sex. And of course, there are so many young people who want to have this conversation. And so many times I've been invited to several places to talk about sex. And it's always the best session of whatever event is going on, you know, because young people want to talk about it and not just talk about it with scripture and just very, you know, hyper spiritual. But first of all, from a place of vulnerability and authenticity, this is the struggle. So number one, you know, abstain from what stimulates number two, be part of the com of the community. And number three, you have to find new hobbies because, right. you know, the hormones that kind of stimulate sexual desire and pleasure um, come from so many things. For example, um, just being with friends and being with people that you love kind of creates the same hormones. So have friends and spend time with them. And next, you have to create new hobbies, spend time in sports and, you know, music. 
there's a name for this thing. I don't know how it's called, you know, but basically it means you're made to be very busy so you don't have time. In fact, I tell some young people sometimes that you're not horny, you're just idle. You know, <laughs> you have very little to do. You're spending all your time with friends, having funny conversations, browsing social media. It is normal that you're going to struggle with several temptations, right? So get busy. All that sexual energy is just, you know, you trying to blow off steam. Go for sports. Sometimes I crack the joke and say, if you're struggling and you want to kiss so bad, just suck, suck ice, right? <laughs> but that's a way of saying, you know, get into another activity and, you know, just focus on something else. Do sports, learn music, True. spend time with people, spend time praying, okay? So um, that is where self-control comes in. You see what I mean? So at the end of the day, the desires are there. They are good. So you need yes. to control yourself and also talk to somebody. Again, that will come up in almost everything. We have this culture in church where we do what we call open conversations. And I've done this several times and it is a very sticky chat where young people just gather like in a support group and just talk about their sexual proclivities and desires they are struggling with. Every time they come in, you feel tension in the room. I feel like I want this. And I say, no, tell me as you really want it as it's in your head. It is a very hard conversation to have, especially as a leader. And it needs to be done with a lot of care and some systems or boundaries. But people will talk about their desires and immediately after the session, oh, they feel better and then we pray and we just speak purely over them and we remind them of why and they move. So having people that you can talk to vulnerably and authentically helps. Okay, while he was talking, I also thought of the fact that many people especially Christians who are struggling with sexual desires, they tend to pray a lot about it, like God take away these desires from yeah. me. I want to inform you that your prayer will not be answered. Yes. That it desire, might get worse. <laughs> the desire will not be taken away from you. You yes. will feel it because it is natural for yeah. you to feel it. Yeah. I feel like what you should be doing more is just having conversations with God about that desire. Yeah. I'll mm. Talk about it with God. Yeah. Pray, you know, when people hear prayer, they think, oh, Lord, Take now I feel like having sex. Take it away from me. Forgive me. <laughs> Forgive me. No, that's You're not human. what I mean. Yeah. Oh, sorry, that's not what I mean. Talk about it with God. God, I feel like having sex right now. And you said in your word that we should not. God, help me with this. So have conversations with God. Yeah. And Talk pray intimate it. prayers, yeah. Lord. This is the desire of my, my flesh, flesh right, now. right now. And I just surrender my body to you that you will minister to my body in a way that sex could never. I've had people pray this prayer and the uh, impact was really different. Just say, Lord, I feel a very burning desire for sexual intimacy and there's nobody right now to satisfy that desire. You know, let me just say this. It is important that you learn this now because even in marriage, mm -hmm. You think you'll be having sex like every morning, afternoon, and evening, especially the guys, yeah? I'm talking to you now. You see, but that's not how it works. You know, there are times in our marriage where I'm busy. In fact, this season, for example, I've been very busy. And some of those seasons, you know, there might not be as much sexual intimacy or very little or sometimes close to none. Of course, you, you need to curb that and manage that. However, sometimes your partner is, you know, not even in the, the country. Your, your spouse has traveled. They're out of town. You still need self-control. What if you feel burning sexual desire when you're married and your partner is not there, you know? And you still need that same self-control, right? Legit question. You, you, you need self-control. So you have to learn to say to the spirit, I feel this way. Just, you know, touch my body and just come over my body in a way that sex could never. And I'm telling you, in the place of prayer, your body can also experience intimacy, your body, not just your soul, your body can be touched. In fact, if God can heal your body of sickness, then he can also touch your body when you're struggling with temptations like sexual desires. So don't be angry or repent for the desires. Just okay, present right. them to God. Yeah. How do I navigate the pressure to engage in sexual activity when I feel like everyone around me is doing it, hmm. Mama is going to talk about that one. Wow. She's going to. It's the confidence that he has in me. No, no, she, she's got the answer to that particular question. Um, the first thing I, I thought of when I heard the question, when I when I heard the question being right, is that you're not everyone, hmm. first of all. Hmm. The fact that everyone wants to kill themselves does not mean you want to kill yourself. 
first of all, I feel like you should understand that you are different. Mm -hmm. And you should start by asking yourself the question, why do I want to keep myself? For example, if you're keeping yourself um, for your husband and you have no reason, you're just um, mm -hmm. infatuated with the idea of being a virgin, it's going to be very easy to lose that virginity when temptation comes. And I feel like that's the position many young girls were in or are in. You know, they just love this idea. When, when I was in school, there was a girl in my class. And she had virgin hair, very long. And <clears throat> anytime she comes to class, she used to brag with it. She would say, I'm as virgin as, um, say, I'm as, virgin as my hair. Mm. You know, so she would say, I have hair. She was trying to tell us, I have virgin hair and I'm a virgin. And it was just an excitement for her. And yeah. that's it for many girls. They're just excited yeah. that they are virgins. And there's nothing wrong with being excited. No, In fact, wrong. you should be excited that you are. But the, bad thing, the, the bad thing is that we're in a generation where nobody really cares about virginity anymore. Yeah. Well. A lot of people do not. That's the impression. Yeah, that's the impression yeah. that if you're a virgin, you are naive. There are a lot of things you don't know, um, you know, which is wrong anyway. Yeah. So you need to know why. You are keeping yourself yeah. first. If you cannot answer the question why, then you cannot even keep yourself. Write, take a pen and a paper, write down your values. Why? Is it because God said so? Is it yeah. because I just love? Is it because I'm keeping myself for the special one? It's a special thing that you present yourself to him. Why am I being a virgin? When you have answered those questions and you have had the conviction in your heart, then you're going to know how to better handle it when your friends say, Yeah. You're still a virgin at this age, yeah. you know, or a man says, give me your virginity, then I'll marry you later. Yeah. So I feel like you know why you are keeping yourself. Why is it important to you? Yeah. Okay. Why is it important? It's, it's just like anything, like maybe you're in school and it's very important for you to pass because you want to do medicine and become a doctor. The reason why you are in school and you're studying hard is because you want to be a doctor. So you study hard. So the reason why you want to keep yourself with all of the pressures, the reason you are going to choose when you start asking yourself those questions. Yeah. And that's what I feel. And again, we can link this up to question one. Why do we get married? Because um, you see, like I said, we marry because of the family unit. When you're born in a healthy family, you don't suffer from such peer pressures because then you have a father who gives you a sense of identity. For example, uh, my daughter at home, I have, uh, you know, my my wife's younger sister who's growing up with us right now as like a daughter, right? And we have very open and honest and really intense conversations about sex. Yeah. You know, so much that sometimes I hear the feedback. So when her friends are talking sex and they are all excited, she doesn't have that excitement. She's like, well, my, my father has already told me everything. You see what I mean? She's confident. She, she's not shaky with her values. She has a sense of identity, she can say no because we've had several conversations about sex and sexual purity and she's sexual desires. Yeah, she's not curious. Yeah, because curiosity is really what triggers, mm -hmm. you know, temptation a lot of times. So she's not curious to know. We, we talk about, you know, she's probably read the book on sex through our conversations before you guys are going to read it. So she's, she's not curious. And, and hence, she's not under any form of pressure. So... Now, if you're really asking, you know, how do you navigate that pressure? I think that the, the real question here is about your sense of identity. As much as you know why you're keeping your virginity, it's also important to know who you are. You're a child of God. You are a pace setter. You're a leader. People should follow you and not the other way around. When you know that, then you start to set the standard. And so when people try to shame you for your virginity or for your values, then, of course, you're not bothered because you know exactly who you are and why you're doing it. And just in talking about virginity and purity, um, I just feel like saying this and I feel like somebody needs to hear this. So we've been talking about answering some sex questions and you're feeling like you already lost your virginity. And I always tell people in school of marriage and every time we talk about sex that um, purity is a much higher standard than virginity, okay? God never emphasized virginity. God emphasized purity because even as a married person, you're no longer a virgin, but God still requires purity. That's why there's something like adultery. You've committed adultery, you're still walking in sexual impurity. You see what I mean? So even if you lost your virginity, you can still continue the war and the fight of purity, so there's more hope. You can't say, oh, I lost it and it's all for me. You can make a new commitment today to walk in sexual purity and everything is going to be different for you. All right.
So um, I think there's a last question, and I'm sure there are many other questions. We might do a part two of this, okay? Another edition. Would you like a part two? Yeah, two more questions. Would you like a part two? Okay, two more questions. Okay, I'm going to read the next one, and then my wife will read the last one. So, by the way, tell us, would you like us to do this again, a part two? Um, would you like us to have an actual hangout? You know, if, if you'd like to be part of that hangout, tell us in the comment section. We're going to organize a beautiful feast and just hang out with the singles and talk about sex, love, dating, and marriage. So, last but one question. How can I have an open and honest conversation about my with my future partner about our sexual boundaries and expectations for sex? Oh. So, <clears throat> how can I have open conversations? I feel like saying, go through counseling, <laughs> you know, because in the school of marriage, we actually have, you know, several chapters on sex at different levels, at dating level, at coaching level, and in marriage level. Uh, where we talk about sex, we talk about sex in ways that you can't even imagine. Uh, and, when, and when I say that's not just talking about the depth of the conversation, but really talking about how rich and structured those conversations are, because people have different sexual proclivities and desires and appetites and different things that create desire, right? So I think when you're dating before marriage, just to answer as generally as I can, because I can't go into those details, the best way to have those conversations, you know, especially without creating temptation, is to talk about fantasies. What are you imagining, right? What do you imagine you would like? Because sometimes what you imagine you like and what you eventually like are not the same thing. And we actually have tests uh, for your sexual blueprint and stuff like that. But what you imagine you like is not what you like. So you can talk about it. What do you think you like about sex? And of course, please disclaimer, if you're having this kind of conversation, have it in an open place and yes. set firm Very boundaries. Important. Okay. If not, you can go from the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> you can easily go from the conversation to the, the action. Practical. You know, you can say, ah, let's let's try. You know, let's for example, you know, the, the lady says, once you touch my ear. <laughs> <laughs> She says, once you touch my ear, I'm gone, you know. And now the guy only wants to touch the ear. You know, the thing about youth, youthfulness is that it creates a lot of, there's a lot of curiosity true. with youthfulness. Yes, right? that's true. If your partner tells you, listen, if you just whisper in my ear, every time you hug your partner, you that's want to. That's my weak point. Yes, yeah, my weak point. You want to whisper in their ear. So this is a very risky conversation. And so we have these conversations with dating couples in counseling so they are having it there with us and it's such a difficult conversation that it's <laughs> you're able to process your fantasy without the desire being triggered because i'm taking you into spheres where you can't even imagine you would go and i'm yeah. it's this high trigger I, i'm trained for it right yeah. so <laughs> you know? I, I also think the reason yeah. why it's important to have it um, with a counselor is because yeah. men are not always very open yeah. about sexuality yeah most of them uh, most of them are shy not shy, most of them feel ashamed yeah. when it comes to sexuality. And they don't so know. If man, yes. <laughs> if a man will feel like, if I tell this woman I want to have, okay, men will probably feel like they want to have sex every day that God has created. Yes. When they wake up in the morning, they want to have sex. Yeah. And immediately you both finish, before they want to dash out for work, they want sex again. Yeah. But they will not easily tell a woman that they will start feeling ashamed that the, this guy, the, the woman will feel like their libido is really high. Yeah. So when you have a counselor who can walk you through, yeah. It's there are also women who express. have higher sexual desire, mm -hmm. right? So it's not a gender thing. Some women love sex and they want a lot of and sex. Men love sex too. But generally, yeah, men who have a higher sexual appetite. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, so talk to the counselor. A counselor will help you have that conversation, mm -hmm. you know, and you will enjoy the conversation if it's a, sure. a trained counselor. Uh, one of the courses I did was, uh, you know, sex therapy. So I also understand how to talk to people. Married couples, single couples, you know, I've had to study a lot um, to help myself to learn and then also to help people so you can have that. Well, in general, just have general conversations, right? Open and general conversations about what, what do you imagine you like? You know, mm -hmm. What do you think you would not like? What are some things that you are interested in? You know, what are some things that you're curious about? And just talk about it. Oh, interesting. Hmm. Don't go into detail. Oh, how do you like it to be? Would you like your back on the floor? Oh, you know, you start creating a <laughs> mental picture of it, especially if your partner is very imaginative. <laughs> they will try. So don't go and tell somebody that, 
once you whisper in my ear, you know, there's, there's some of those details that are not necessary. You can just say something general like, you know, I love when the tension is built before the act. So the person has, when you marry me, will discover what tension means. Okay. Or if you're with a counselor, they know how to navigate that conversation. So, well, there you have it. Again, many of these questions, we need to give room for people to understand that we can't give very practical answers because one, we don't have enough time. And two, sometimes we need to sit with you to understand where you are. So last question. Okay. Uh, I feel like this is for the married couples. Mm. Is it really submission to collect all of your earnings and hand it over to your husband to decide <laughs> what the family or what what should be done with it so what this person is practically saying if is if i'm earning say a million francs should i go to the bank on the day when i'm paid collect the one me and bring it to my husband and say papa mm. there the funds as you like <laughs> Finance is, is that, very is that risky. Do you think that's? I think you should answer that question. Is that submission? Yeah, David, submit to me. Hallelujah. Give me your one million. <laughs> right. Well, uh, practically speaking, well, there's no one size fits all, but there are very strong recommendations. You yeah. see what I'm saying here? The very strong recommendation would be that the couple needs to sit down and actually have an agreement as to what their finance management system will be. Yes. So are we going to bring both our salaries together and then together we agree what we're doing with it? Are we going to bring a certain percentage of our salaries and then you know we pay our tithe and do our personal things with? You see, I would always recommend that if you're a couple and you can see each other naked and have sex, then you should bring all your finance together. Okay. I don't think it should be a one-sided thing. So the woman brings the man and he decides whatever he wants to do with it, right? <laughs> um, I also don't think that you should hide the money you're making from your partner, right? Sometimes uh, in some very rare cases, one partner has had to withhold because the other partner is careless and maybe this partner will take the money and gamble or do something careless, whereas a child's school fees needs to be paid. And I understand those particular cases, right, where... You've had to withhold the details. I don't want to say lie, but you know, but just withhold or be discreet about these details for the sake of the family's, you know, advancement. But God's desire is that you bring this finance together. The Bible actually says two are better than one <laughs> because they have a better reward for their labor. You see, better reward for labor. So you work, I work, and we have a better reward together. So we bring the monies together. And then we can have conversations about how we want this money to be spent and we must be in agreement, okay? Do we have a family project and so on? Um, um, we have a recommended percentage that we tell people in counseling, you know, 30% to this, 10% to this. But I always say that no matter what, if somebody works, a part of their money should just go to take care of them, right? Um, of course, after you're paid your tithes as a family, a part of that money should take care of you. You work. So just feel like you're doing a job, Right. You know, at certain times or at certain moments in your marriage, maybe where you're not very financially buoyant, you'd realize that the money is not much, so you bring it all and it's meeting a greater family need. Uh, need. Yeah. But generally, I think it should be a unanimous agreement. There should be a system. So build your system. Is it percentages? Is it um, that we bring in and then decide per month? But there should be a system. That's the best way I can answer this because for different cases, different models might work yeah i'd like to say yeah. this while he was talking i was just thinking sometimes you could be on a journey with god about you know maybe giving more and you get like an instruction that you should give all of your finances to your husband please don't bring the question yet that's a, a discussion between you and god and your husband and depending your on husband. your system Right. Because like I said, sometimes you can think that you are very generous until you get to the level where you are now earning and you have to, you know, share the responsibility or you have to bring your own part of the money to the table. Yeah. Yeah. So training will be, yeah. you, you could be training yourself to be more generous. I'll bring this money. I'll give it to my husband. He'll decide. 
especially if you have a trustworthy one who loves you. Sometimes you bring it and he says, no, baby, it's your money. Do what you want to do with it. And sometimes this is a very difficult conversation when the wife is earning more than the yeah. man. You know? When the man is earning more, sometimes it's like, yeah, your money is yours. My money is ours. Sometimes men are that generous. But when the wife is earning, say, 10 million francs and the husband is at a million francs, <laughs> You know, things can get really tricky from yeah. there, you know. Um, but I think that there should be a system. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. As a couple, sit down and decide what that system is going to be. And if you're unable to come to a compromise or conclusion, then seek counsel from a counselor. Meet a counselor who is going to weigh down the family needs with you, and, you know, counselors, if you're a good marriage counselor, then you must have been trained in financial management systems. Because there's one of the things that you need to consider, spending habits, you know, or your money personality. There are some people who are huge spenders, some people are huge savers, some people are, there are different money personalities. So a good marriage counselor should also understand financial management and to help you with a customized system for your marriage. So there you have it. Well... It's been nice answering, I think, 14 or 15 questions. I don't know how many there were exactly. I've enjoyed myself suggesting a few answers. I hope you enjoyed yourself listening and just enjoying the craziness that comes into um, creating a video like this and answering questions like this. Um, if you have more questions, please put them in the comment section. If you have follow-up questions, put them in the comment section. And we'll try to engage you right there. And if you're not following Gold Rock Church, please follow us on all platforms. We have some really exciting events coming up this 2024. You're going to enjoy them. Well, that said, we're just going to pray for you even as we conclude. Is that, is that good? Yeah. Yeah. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, we just pray for all those who are watching right now and tune in to this, you know, session on sex, love, dating, and marriage. Lord, I just pray that for each one of them, you will speak to them and teach them that great shall be their peace, that they will understand exactly that which is your desire with regards to sex, with love, with dating and marriage. Lord, for those who are trusting you for a life partner, I pray that you will answer their prayers. Lord, those who are struggling with different kinds of temptations, Holy Spirit, I pray that you will bring them comfort to their bodies, that they will resist the urges to fall into sin. And God, I just pray that by reason of this teaching, you will bring freedom from different people struggling with all sorts of addictions. In the mighty name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. 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 Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you so much for listening. Um, we can't wait to see you next Wednesday. It's going to be a beautiful teaching. And God bless you. Catch you next time. Bye. <laughs>